physician specialized in aviation and space medicine. Uh, I trained at the University of Alberta uh, and I was sponsored by the Canadian military and as a result of that I owed them a few years afterwards which I gladly did. I loved the military. I've always been interested in uh, aviation since I grew up in Medicine Hat uh, during the war. And of course that was one of the major training bases and I remember looking, watching all of these little yellow airplanes flying around making a heck of a racket over Medestat, sometimes buzzing the houses and that type of thing. So I've always had loved the aviation. The first flight I ever had, I was four years old and it was a, a oh my God, what do you call them, a, not a flying circus, a, a barnstormer. It, it would, was a barnstormer who gave me my first flight uh, when I was four years old. And I remember it vividly and uh, I swore at that time that I was going to be a pilot someday. And uh, I didn't really have a chance until uh, I graduated from high school. I tried to get into uh, flying training and the Air Force was not taking pilots at that time. They said you had to have a degree so I said, well, I can't afford to get one, what can I do? And they said, well, you can maybe go through the ROTP, which I tried. And I finally got in uh, the, after a couple of years uh, when I couldn't um, uh, get start university because I didn't have an, enough money. And uh, in order to go through the medical officer training plan, you needed to have a, at least one year of medicine after your pre-med. So at any rate, um, I got a job, I had trouble finding work and I got a job in a medical lab. And although I was really interested in physics before, I became interested in medicine as well. And I decided that I would like to try to become a doctor. And uh, I did. In fact, uh, I went through the undergraduate medical subsidization plan that the Air Force had, the military had and uh, they paid my way through and I owed them a few years afterwards and I actually it was a wonderful program and I highly recommend this program to anybody who is uh, thinking of becoming a physician because it removes a, one terrible burden which is the burden of debt that you can run up huge amounts of debt uh, going through uh, medical school it's now called the MOTP and I'm not advertising it uh, but I'm telling you about it because it's a very, very good program. So because of that, uh, eventually I had been stationed in, in Coal Lake and was able to get a couple of trips in T-Birds and 104, uh, 104D in the back seat. And uh, that just cemented it more and more, the love of flying. And uh, afterwards I was posted, after I interned in Saskatoon, I was posted to Rivers, Manitoba. And at one time we had a, a joke amongst the MOTP people that the worst place in the world that you could be was Rivers, Manitoba. But it turned out to be a wonderful posting. And uh, one of the things that they uh, did was they said, well, how would you like to, to learn how to fly the L-19? So I said, well, yeah, let me think. Okay. And so I, uh, I took, went through the L-19 program. And then uh, the L-182, the Beach 18. Then uh, we were stationed, posted to uh, Portage the Prairie when the 4FTS moved to uh, Portage the Prairie. And there'd been a number of helicopter accidents. Uh, the uh, Hiller 12E Nomad was the training helicopter that was used by the uh, military, Canadian military as their basic trainer and it was a difficult airplane to fly. Uh, in helicopter terms it was the hardest that I'd ever uh, flown. 
But they were having a number of accidents with these, including a friend uh, who died in a crash, caught fire. And uh, so they asked me if I would go through. And I, I said, well, let me think. Okay. And uh, so I went, started on the uh, helicopter uh, training course, and I went through. They thought maybe there could be some human factors involved in uh, these accidents, and sure enough, there were. And so I wrote a series of papers about about the human, what I found in the human factors area. And uh, uh, at, at any rate, uh, got my qualifications. I still hold a commercial helicopter and, and uh, fixed wing license. But uh, um, at any rate, uh, the University of Southern California, the professor there, got a hold of a couple of the papers and he said, well, look, at, uh, if you put this together in a book, and by this time I was out on Civvy Street and I was actually uh, doing civilian accidents, which were very frequent in that era, and uh, so I put, put it together wrote what, what experience I had also with the, on Civvy Street and it became used as a textbook at the University of Southern California so that's how I got my start in, uh, in teaching and uh, also then uh, I was invited by uh, this, the Stockholm Rural Technical Institute in Stockholm to assist with their courses, uh, their annual courses in in flight safety and aircraft accident investigation, uh, which I did there for 14 years. I spent 20 years uh, going down to uh, Los Angeles for the uh, courses there at the uh, University of Southern California, which are quite well-known courses. So that's how I got into the accident investigation part and the human factors part. Uh, I had become very, very interested in that. And one of the things that, that I had done was when I had planned on staying in the military, but uh, this, the Department of Transport offered me a, a job as a regional aviation medical officer in uh, Winnipeg. And if I would take the job, they would send me to England for postgraduate work at the Royal Air Force Institute of Aviation Medicine. So I uh, took the, I left the military reluctantly. I, I had signed a permanent commission, but I, I left, and I, uh, the lure of going to England to uh, study aviation medicine was great, and so I have no regrets about that. It was a wonderful program. Also, I spent some time at the uh, Royal Air Force Institute of Tropical Medicine and the Royal, In the Royal, Avi the, uh, Royal Air Force Institute of uh, Aviation Pathology. So that's where I gained uh, background in, in, plus the, or in the accident investigation. Plus, I worked on, on over a hundred accidents over a period of time. That's where that comes from. And I had been involved in aircraft accident investigation for many years. I've worked on over a hundred investigations. What I'm going to talk to you about uh, today is the story of uh, CFPAB, which was a Lockheed L-188 Electra that crashed up at Ray Point uh, in uh, Northwest Territories, or now in Nunavut, uh, in 1974. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well this, this, the story begins in uh, 1974. On, um, let's see without my glasses. The story uh, begins in about in November 1974 when uh, I was living in Winnipeg and I was part of the central region of the Department of Transport, uh, part of the GO team for aircraft accidents in that region. In fact, in uh, northwest Ontario, uh, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Northwest Territories. This particular day, November 1974, the phone rang about 4 o'clock in the morning. I had just gone to bed. I'd been to a lecture at uh, one of the, the centers. Uh, I believe it was Alvin Toffler who was giving a presentation on the future. 
But at any rate, uh, I managed to get a couple of hours sleep and the phone rang and lo and behold, there, there was a kind of a sleepy voice at the other end of the phone that said there's been a major accident up in a place called Ray Point, uh, way far north Canada, and it's reported that there were 32 fatalities on this particular flight. Would I be ready within two hours to take off from the airport in Winnipeg? To fly to uh, Calgary. The aircraft uh, belonged to Pan Arctic Oils, which was 49% owned by the Canadian government. And uh, this was, uh, Ray Point was a, an exploration uh, camp up in the, in the high Arctic where they're searching for oil and uh, natural gas. And so the, the camp had been built up there. Most of the buildings that were there had been flown up in the back of Hercules aircraft and they were built by uh, ATCO. But at any rate, uh, so I appeared at the airport and uh, we headed to Calgary, which is the head office of Pan Arctic Oils, which owned the aircraft. And uh, we were given a briefing then. And then we, were, we climbed aboard CFPAK, which is another L-188 Electra, and headed north. First of all, we stopped in, in Edmonton to pick up some extra passengers, and then we took off and headed uh, up to Ray Point, which is about a four and a half hour uh, flight. It's very, very far north. In fact, uh, it's so far north that compasses are totally unreliable up there. You can see a compass swing of 90 degrees within a couple of uh, hours. So therefore, any navigation had to be done by ADF or sun compasses. Uh, so we arrived at uh, Ray Point at around midnight and I sat in the jump seat uh, just so that I could see the approach, visualize the approach. I was a qualified pilot and I had an IFR rating and uh, it was to see if there was something visually that had gone wrong uh, that caused this aircraft to crash. We landed in Ray Point, it was extremely cold. Uh, the, uh, there was a very high wind and the temperature was about minus 52. Uh, so we first of all went to uh, our particular uh, cabin where we were, where we, their bunkhouse where we stayed for the next uh, few days. And the first thing in the morning we had a meeting of everyone involved and uh, just a bit of a briefing about what had happened. Apparently the aircraft had gone down about half past midnight and uh, they had been two survivors, uh, the, the first officer and flight engineer plus one passenger who survived for a period of time but died on the way into, uh, uh, on, the, on the way uh, to Edmonton where he was to receive medical attention. It was decided that we would head out onto the ice and most people are pretty anxious uh, when there are accident investigations to start kicking tin and I kind of held them back a little bit and I said look at you know this has been fresh sea ice which is only about seven inches thick and even at seven inches uh, thick uh, fresh ice because of the saline in the ice it, the ice can be quite soft and dangerous in addition to that we'd had a, a major aircraft accident that had hit on the ice about three and a half miles short of, or three miles short of the uh, actual uh, runway. So we decided that maybe we better take some safety precautions and that really we should uh, have a rope, we should be roped to the shore or to the pack ice uh, in case we went, anyone went through. In fact, most people did go through at some point or another the worst thing was a, a, a wet foot, which is difficult to, to, to endure in that uh, sort of uh, temperature range. So we decided that we would go, go in teams. Uh, I was assigned or, to the identification team where we would go in and find the victims and uh, map their location uh, and, and photograph the uh, area as uh, required. And what we found when we got to the site was absolute uh, desolation. I mean, the aircraft was scattered all over the ice. Uh, there was one engine sitting on top of the ice, the other three engines had gone down. 
Uh, we were told that the cockpit had broken off and had slid down the uh, ice about 900 feet and then dropped through and was on the uh, bottom. Uh, the first thing that we did was we roped together in groups of four and then roped, roped to the uh, shore uh, in case of uh, somebody going through the, through the ice. Uh, there were one of the things that they left for us because there's a thread of polar bears in that area was they left a couple of rifles uh, leaning up against the one, the engine that was on the surface. Uh, what they didn't realize, of course, was that you couldn't fire them; they were just frozen solid. So uh, there, there we were. One of the things we noticed initially was that there was a lot of of small Arctic foxes running around the area, and one of the reasons that they were there was that the the aircraft uh, amongst its, uh, in its cargo had a thousand pounds of chocolate chip cookies and these were scattered all over the ice. And the little uh, arctic foxes just loved these these things. And so they were, they were very tame. Uh, they didn't realize how destructive human beings could be and so they were actually running around between our feet and so on. When they disappeared uh, we knew that we were on the menu for a polar bear and uh, so we had to be very careful about that and that's one of the reasons that the rifles had been uh, left for us. The, um, uh, when we got out onto the ice what had happened was that uh, uh, I was with uh, three mounted police uh, ident people and we went around to the different bodies that were on, this, on the surface and mapped where they were and left a, a, a pin, a stake, uh, when, the body, uh, when the bodies had been uh, removed so we could map it out uh, late, later on. One of the problems we had was that the uh, labels that we had were, were wire tied and it was so cold that the wires just snapped like glass. We couldn't use them. So we tried using tape. We had some masking tape there. But again, it was so cold that it wouldn't stick. So we ended up having to tie the labels onto the, the stakes with string. And of course that meant taking off our gloves. With, and in the cold, uh, most of us got some sort of uh, frostbite. One of the problem things that I had to do was to take photographs of where the bodies were in situ and also part of the wreckage. And that was a real problem because of the extreme cold. Now I had an Arctic parka and what I did was I carried the camera uh, in the park behind my neck uh, where it would be warm enough when I pulled it out to uh, actually uh, work. And uh, these were Asha High Pentax uh, 35 millimeter cameras. And I took a lot of pictures and every single one of them turned out. It was just amazing. Uh, it meant that I ended up with some frostbite on my hands but uh, the, the pictures uh, all turned out, which is uh, in, incredible. So we, what would happen was we had to limit the number of people out on the ice. We had sent two divers uh, ahead, roped together and then roped to the shore uh, to lay out polypropylene rope to delineate areas where it was safe to walk and where, where uh, we could have one person or two people or four people. Uh, where the, a lot of the victims were, uh, we could only have four people at a time. So I would go in with the team and we'd take the photographs, stake the area and uh, label it and then withdraw and the next team that came in would remove the victims and, and take them into the morgue that was set up in uh, Great Point. There was a number of victims that were uh, stuck in the ice and there was a number on the bottom including the captain who was still apparently in the, in the cockpit. Well, it turns out he was still in the, in the cockpit. Uh, the two survivors uh, were flown immediately to uh, Edmonton before we got there. Uh, they were injured. Uh, in fact, the first officer lost both of his hands as a result of a severe frostbite and later on was actually able to get back flying because of the development of prosthesis which allowed him to cover, to, to fly a uh, twin otter. Um, where are we here? Yeah, so we recovered the bodies that were on the surface of the ice and then uh, also 
we wanted to uh, find out what was on the bottom and find out where the cockpit was and whether there was wreckage scattered along. As I mentioned before, the cockpit had slid about 900 feet uh, along the ice and it had broken off just uh, behind the cockpit, which is the usual case for long-bodied uh, aircraft. Usually a long-bodied aircraft will break up just after the cockpit and behind the uh, wing. And this it was a typical uh, breakup. Uh, most of the aircraft was, was on the bottom. Uh, the three engines were, were on the bottom, uh, which resulted in some difficulty in terms of trying to determine what settings were, uh, et, et cetera. In order to map out the area, uh, there were holes that were dug in the ice or bored in the ice about every 15 feet and cameras were lowered down to take a video of the area and this is how we located exactly where the, the uh, uh, cockpit of the aircraft uh, was and we determined that we would uh, maybe if, if we were going to recover anything from the body uh, from the bottom of the uh, sea it would be the uh, cockpit. So the job of, of collecting the bodies, uh, some of them were frozen in, in the ice, like I mentioned, and others were on the bottom. Uh, I worked with the IDENT team from the RCMP in uh, chipping out the bodies from the block, from the ice. Uh, what happened was that they were frozen in the ice, and some of the, uh, uh, the what was hap what they did was they cut out blocks and brought them up onto the surface and then we chipped away at the ice to get the uh, victims out. It was a very tedious and heartbreaking task. There were about seven victims in one of the blocks of, of ice. The ones from the on the bottom were easier to recover. Problem One of the problems was is that the uh, water was about 110 feet deep and we were concerned about uh, the bends. So we had a hyperbaric chamber flown up from from uh, Vancouver. Uh, the divers had, had were had, uh, with a company in Vancouver and were specialized in cold weather uh, diving. And uh, because of the the problems with the temperature and the fact that we couldn't allow many people on the ice, uh, what we, what we did was we developed a kind of a, a large sheet of plywood nailed together and uh, there was a Quonset type of tent that was uh, built up on the on the uh, uh, platform. And that means that we could have about seven people there at, at one time. And at one end of the the tent uh, there was a, a hole cut in the ice and the physiological monitoring and, and vision equipment was set up, was set up at the the end. So the uh, because you can't scuba dive in that cold water, uh, the temperature of the water was about minus four Celsius, and of course we were concerned about the the regulators freezing up. So they used what they called rat hats, and these were the rat hats were in, were designed by this company in Vancouver. They also because of the type of recovery that was uh, necessary. They hired a, um, a person, who, an American, who had been uh, instrumental in clearing the Suez Canal of wreckages after the war between uh, Israel and uh, Egypt. And he was very experienced in underwater uh, recovery and supervised the recovery of the different parts. Because there was so much on the bottom, it was decided that uh, we could not uh, afford to bring it all up, so we would uh, instruct the divers of what we wanted to see, for example, engine settings and that sort of thing, different um, uh, parts of the aircraft, and they would go down and photograph it with the video camera, which we could observe live, and then take uh, photographs with the uh, underwater cameras uh, to get uh, solid film uh, photographs, which were much more uh, detailed. The, the, because of the depth of the water, the uh, uh, diver's time was uh, limited uh, down below. And one of the interesting things was the amount of life that was down on the bottom of the ocean in that area, like seals, for example, 
and every so often a seal would poke its head up through the uh, in the tent to have a look around see what these people were doing on the surface. The polar bears, well, once in a while we did encounter them or they encountered us or tried to and on one particular occasion I was working with the Mounties uh, removed, trying to chip out some bodies from uh, a big block of ice and uh, all of a sudden the arctic foxes disappeared and I thought okay what's happening I turned around and looked and I could see coming towards me three black dots which were the two eyes and the nose of a polar bear and I was kind of alarmed about that so I didn't want to become uh, you know, part of the feces of a polar bear. So the, the sergeant who was a, a, the RCMP sergeant who was really a legend in the north, uh, I, I told him, I said, look at there's a polar bear coming up. He turned around and had a look at it and then went back to chipping away. And I was kind of really concerned. I was getting frightened about this polar bear coming up and I turned around and it was getting closer. I said, hey Sarge, it's getting closer. And he'd say, oh yeah, okay. And chip away. And then finally, uh, uh, you know, I said, I'm, I'm you know, pretty alarmed about this whole situation. So he grabbed the shotgun and fired into the air, and he didn't even look to see the polar bear run away. You know, let me tell you that these things can go really quickly. I had one run across the path behind me, and uh, the path that led from the pack ice out to the wreckage uh, site. And I heard this noise, and I turned around, and there was a polar bear chasing an Arctic fox. And it was fast, it was like a freight train, and I knew that there's no way we could uh, ever outrun, outrun uh, one of those uh, polar bears. I went and looked at its uh, paw prints, and they were enormous, they were bigger than my, my uh, winter flying boots for sure. So at any rate, we kept on working at getting the, uh, the victims out and, and getting as much information as we could from the aircraft. And then at the, the final thing that we did was we raised the cockpit. That meant uh, chopping a very large hole in the ice and uh, uh, setting up a tripod uh, with, with wood. And I don't know where we got the got the wood, but wooden poles, I guess, that had been shipped up there, and set up a tripod and uh, block and tackle, and we pulled it up up uh, through the ice. Uh, and the problem, the the object was to have a look and see if there was any movement of the controls, switches, and that sort of thing. And this is a notoriously inaccurate uh, films that we had seen before that were taken uh, by uh, General Dynamics down in the, in the desert where they were crashing airplanes against the side of hills and that sort of thing, showing the cockpit, uh, the uh, switches would be going up and down, on and off, and thing, things moving all over. So, but there was enough evidence there to determine uh, where a needle slap was, for example, on an instrument. Uh, so, also the captain was uh, still in the cockpit, and so we recovered him. He was the last person that we uh, uh, did recover. So now we had uh, a number of parts. Uh, most of it still, as far as I know, on the bottom, 110 feet, and uh, it was enough to give us uh, some ideas. The important thing was that we had two survivors, the first officer and flight engineer. Cockpit voice recorder and the um, data recorder were not operable. Uh, the, they were very old type of design and the foil that was in them to record whatever activities there were, and there was a limited number, I think only about eight different uh, uh, parameters that could measure plus the cockpit recorder, voice recorder, the tape was torn and so we were able, not able to get very much information whatsoever out of the flight data recorders. But what we did have is we had the evidence uh, of the, the flight first officer and flight engineer in the cockpit. And what they said when they traced the, the uh, flight was that it had been basically an uneventful flight from Calgary to Edmonton where they picked up extra passengers. And there was one passenger in Edmonton when they searched his luggage before he got on the aircraft they found a bottle of whiskey and uh, 
gambling and alcohol were absolutely prohibited up in those uh, northern camps for a very good reason. So he was kicked off the airplane. And in fact, uh, that bottle of whiskey saved his life. And I wonder if he still has it on his mantle or, or not. But uh, uh, the first officer and flight engineer were able to describe what had happened in the, on that flight. Uh, it, it was about 12.30 a.m. Uh, when they were to make their approach to uh, Ray Point. The uh, ETA was very close to that area. And they, they started their descent from 25,000 feet. Just before they started letting down, they had a, a steak dinner, and, uh, th which may have played a, a factor uh, later on in, the, in the, uh, what happened in the, in the uh, cockpit of the aircraft. They had a steak dinner. The limits for Ray Point uh, were uh, uh, 450 feet and one mile. They set their altimeters to that. And they were about six miles out, and uh, they're, they're still were having some difficulty uh, seeing. Uh, the, the, there was an ILS with the glide slope and so on, and uh, also a, a VOR. But uh, the captain, when they reset their altimeters, he set his to 300 feet, his radio altimeter. And for an unknown reason. And as they approached the ice flows that, that break off and drift out, he, he proclaimed, uh, we're above the clouds and must get below. Now here we are at 300 feet and traveling at a, the approach speed of about 130 knots or so. And he stuffed the nose forward to the point where the first officer and flight engineer were, were alarmed because of the negative G that they uh, experienced. The first officer was relatively inexperienced and this was the first time he'd flown this particular captain. The flight engineer uh, was quite experienced in the company and with Lockheed Electras. Uh, he was not a, a licensed pilot. He did have a private license, but uh, their flight, a flight engineer at that time was a flight engineer and that was it. He had control over the, the uh, engines and uh, also monitoring the other parameters. And at any rate, uh, they started shouting out the altitudes and uh, the first officer finally grabbed the controls and yarded back as hard as he could and pushed the, thro the power levers forward, but it was too late. The aircraft continued its descent into the, into the, on surface, onto the surface of the ice and uh, the, with the ensuing uh, crash. Now, uh, they had uh, indicated to the uh, radio operator at Ray Point that they would be landing at about 17 minutes past midnight, and that point, that, that time occurred, and there was no message from the aircraft. And it was an hour, almost an hour, before they finally were decided that there was something wrong, and uh, there was an RCMP twin otter on the site at Ray Point, and so they took off, and as soon as they took off, they could see flames in the distance on the approach path to uh, Ray Point runway. And that's when they knew that that, uh, that, that it had gone wrong, and that's what uh, possibly uh, delayed you know, some of the victims from not uh, surviving. So we were up at Ray Point for over a week. Uh, it just seemed a lot longer. And then finally, and I ordered the, the bodies to be sent down to Edmonton and to have autopsies on all of them to uh, see what kind of injury patterns there were, if there were any events that happened, any medical events, etc., that may have resulted or being uh, contributed to the uh, accident. Uh, I also hired Dr. Neville Croson, who was at that time Canada's leading expert in uh, crash pathology. In fact, in any military accidents or whatever, we're all shift to Winnipeg to uh, Dr. Croson to uh, uh, do the 
the post-mortem examinations. Dr. Croson uh, uh, then uh, solicited uh, help from some of the local pathologists to do the autopsies. And by this time I had flown down to Edmonton and so I was there for uh, most of the autopsies, including the, the uh, captain uh, of the uh, aircraft. And uh, it, it was just mainly the uh, evidence of a of the type of crash that there was. In fact, some of it some, they could have survived. Some of them were were were, were survivable, but uh, due to a lot of circumstances, uh, did not. As I mentioned before, one of them had uh, survived and died on the way down to uh, Edmonton. So I assisted with the uh, autopsies. Now, one of the things that uh, we were doing at that time was assisting, as everyone knows, Wilbur Franks uh, was the person who invented the first G-suit, the Franks uh, uh, flying suit or anti-G suit as they uh, called it, which was a water-filled type of suit. But he. He was doing a lot of research in other areas. And Wilbur Franks was uh, doing a study, long-term study, uh, looking at what he called awareness of mortal danger. And that is when a person is aware that they're in, in terrible danger, there's an adrenergic response where the ad adrenaline glands secrete adrenaline into the bloodstream. And this circulates around to different organs, and as it hits an organ, the organ goes into anaerobic metabolism. And, of course, it hits the organs at different times. It takes about two minutes for the blood to uh, circulate all the way through. And so if you measure uh, different organs uh, and look at the lactic acid inside these different organs, you can get an idea of the timing, how long a person was aware that they were in mortal danger. danger. And, of course, uh, because of this particular type of ac accident, maybe the information may become valuable, uh, but at least it may concern uh, an advance in research. I know that law enforcement and so on have been very interested in this particular type of study. But what we would do is that we were supplied with blue boxes with a thermos in them, a really high quality thermos, and we would take the uh, bits of organ, like kidneys, whatever, and uh, put them in a condom. Um, and, of course, because of this was mass, mass, mass casualties, it was difficult to, uh, to find enough uh, thermoses for them, and, and even more difficult to find condoms that weren't lubricated. So uh, we did manage that, and uh, we were collecting the, the organs in, in, uh, for each, each uh, victim in a separate thermos. And these were dispatched to the Defense and Civil Institute of Environmental Medicine in Toronto, where the analysis was uh, was performed. At the end of the autopsy sessions, um, I was busy working with the other investigators trying to determine what had happened in a particular case. And uh, we actually had hired a, an expert, one of the Canada's leading experts in liver disease, uh, Dr. Fisher, and uh, we were working uh, together, and my wife Pat had come up to Edmonton, uh, that's where I graduated from, we knew people there, uh, to visit and or be with me. And uh, so I had a meeting scheduled one particular day, and so I asked her and if she would mind taking the cameras, the Polaroid cameras that we had rented from a, a camera shop back. And uh, we were using Polaroid cameras to, for, the, for evidence, plus we were using the condoms for, for the, uh, collecting the organs. And so I had this box, I handed her this box uh, of cameras and I didn't realize that there were condoms in the box as well. And she went back to the uh, camera shop and presented them, the owner with this box and who decided he would count to make sure that everything was there. 
and uh, so he saw the cameras and then he saw the little boxes and he opened them and there was a condom he said what's this for and and uh, my wife who was a very demure shy lady said uh, well my husband has used them to put organs in and uh, the proprietor said well, I, I suppose he is isn't he and uh, so that was not quite the end of a marriage, but it was uh, an exciting moment. At any rate, uh, for various reasons, uh, and for reasons that, that are sometimes well hidden, uh, we, did never, we never did do a proper investigation according to, to ICAO standards, uh, the format that, that's used internationally for accident investigations. Instead it became a public inquiry and it seemed that the, the federal government was suppressing or wanted to suppress the information that was coming out possibly because there's a, because of the pilot who had severe liver disease. His liver was about twice the normal weight and the microscopic ex examination showed that it was uh, mostly fatty liver with uh, inflammation. And this, uh, we, we felt, could have been uh, one of the contributors to the accident. It is, did not make any sense at all that this uh, captain, uh, at 300 feet and 130-odd knots, would suddenly bump the aircraft, uh, thinking that he's above clouds, interpreted the ice flow as being clouds. Uh, to us, it was an obvious incapacitation. And we had also an explanation now of why it could be a uh, incapacitation in having a liver that was very uh, fatty and inflamed. And in fact, what can happen is that uh, uh, when when you consume proteins, and the crew had had a steak just before the, they started the descent into Ray Point, uh, proteins are some proteins are detoxified by the liver. The fact that it's mean, detoxified means that they're toxic, and in fact some amino acids are in quantity. Normally the liver would, de, uh, would detoxify these amino acids. And in fact, as Dr. Fisher pointed out, one of the common causes of death in, in alcoholics is uh, protein poisoning. They end up in, a, in the hospital emergency and they succumb to protein poisoning rather than, than just pure alcohol. We found out that the, the pilot actually had a hobby farm. And he was a young fellow, he was only 30 years old. had a har uh, hobby farm and he'd been cleaning implements with carbon tetrachloride, which of course is very hepatotoxic. And this may have been one of the contributors to his severe liver disease. The government was not happy with that particular type of, of uh, report, considering that there's a possibility that alcohol had, could have been a, a, a contribution to the accident. And uh, they took some steps to uh, come up with some alternative fact or alternative explanation for what had happened. Not in itself as another adventure. The, the inquiry went on for about two years and uh, I worked on that one along with everybody else plus other accidents in between for, uh, for two years and then finally uh, Dr. Stevenson or Mr. or Judge, uh, pardon, Judge Stevenson uh, yeah, Judge uh, Stevenson came out with a report about two years later uh, where he indicated that, yeah, there was possibly in, uh, liver problems, but didn't believe that that contributed to the uh, accident. It's really hard to find any kind of another ex explanation for that sort of erratic behavior in, uh, term in the captain. I think that if if the first officer had been more experienced and if they had cockpit resource management and followed the two communication rule, that probably this wouldn't have happened. But 
any rate, that was the end of CFPAB and the, and the death of uh, 32 young men who were geologists, engineers, very productive uh, people. It was a terrible tragedy to those in the camp who were these were their personal friends. So, uh,